I hope you mean that when you sing it. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. We don't need to be thrilled by anything else. He gives us complete fulfillment, complete satisfaction, complete peace. Please take your Bibles and turn to that passage we read just a few moments ago out of the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 15. Today we're looking at Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, part 15. Now last time we were here in Exodus was back on January 7th, and last week was Brother McCoy who gave a message on David and Goliath. And so today we're back to Bitter Waters and Sweet, Naomi in the Desert, part 15. So what we're doing right now is looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. They rebelled, of course, at Mara here in our text for today, Exodus chapter 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, went three days in the wilderness. They couldn't find water except the bitter water of Mara, and so they screamed out at Moses, what shall we drink? Mara means bitter. We learned some very important principles from that bitter experience of Israel. We learned that God designs pain in our lives to cause us to trust him. If you have pain in your life, don't complain against God. We saw that's a very dangerous thing to do. If there's pain in your life, learn to give thanks and learn to discern what it is that God is trying to teach you through the pain. God designed that pain to cause us to trust him to cause us to get our eyes off the temporal affairs of earth, to cause us to learn to trust him in every painful circumstance of life. Suffering comes before blessing. Pain comes before joy. When you're going through the desert of suffering, remember that there is blessing and joy on the other end if, but only if, you walk by faith. That was the next principle that we learned out of the experience at Mara was that the walk of faith is essential to the productive, joyful Christian life. We talked about how walking portrays the daily progress and accomplishment that goes on in our life. But daily accomplishment, not in terms of material things, daily accomplishment and progress in terms of our spiritual growth and spiritual accomplish accomplishments as we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It implies a destination. It implies a goal. It's a clear statement that the individual believes something to be true which he or she cannot see. That's what faith, in fact, is all about. Are you walking by faith? Or are you walking on the basis of what you can see, what you can hear, what you can smell, what you can taste, what you can touch? Most of us function on the basis of our five senses. And we put it together in our brains and we reason our way through it and think this is the way that I should do it because this will get me into the least amount of trouble and this will make the wave smooth so that other people around me won't look at me too weird and then I can make a lot of money and I can accomplish the goals that I want to accomplish before I die and I can't take it with me anyway. That's really stupid, folks. That is really stupid. If you can't take it with you, what are you doing it for? Think about it. But did you know that everything you do in this life can count for eternity and you can take it with you? If you do it by faith, that is, in obedience to the word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God. Paul says, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto the men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect of persons. How much was included? And whatsoever ye do, What you take with you is what you do to the glory of God. If you do it to satisfy the flesh, you don't take it with you. If you do it to compromise your way out of a tight spot, you don't take it with you. If you do it to hoard it in the bank, 
for yourself, you don't take it with you. But you can do everything for the glory of God and you receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. When you make your decisions about what you're doing in daily life and it can be your housework, you know, it can be your shopping at the grocery store. Are you doing it for the flesh or are you doing it for the glory of God? in obedience to the word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit. If it doesn't meet those qualifications, it's not the walk of faith, and it's not for the glory of God. I hope you get that principle. That's what the whole Bible is about. Faith. Faith for salvation. Faith for the Christian life. Faith that looks to the promises of God instead of looking at temporal things. That's what Hebrews 11 tells us about all the heroes of faith in the Bible. And it's not a complete list. It's not complete unless you fit into it. The walk of faith. And so we talked about that and we saw that Abraham was the father of those that walk by faith over in Romans chapter 4. You can be an heir of Abraham by faith. We saw that we walk by faith, not by sight, over in 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We saw that that context was very significant because it deals with heavenly rewards, just what I've quoted to you out of Colossians chapter, th uh, 20, uh, excuse me, chapter 3, verses 23 through 25, that long passage I quoted just a moment ago. It all deals with the walk of faith, and it all deals with heavenly rewards and the inheritance that we get when we walk by faith and then stand before Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is the place where the believers receive their heavenly rewards. It's not the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. Two different judgments are mentioned there in the Bible. There are several others as well. Judgment of the nations, judgment of Satan and his angels, and so on. Judgment of the Antichrist, judgment of the false prophet. There are multiple different judgments coming down the road, but the two big ones that people normally get confused are the great white throne judgment where all the unbelievers, those who have rejected Christ, those who have trusted in something besides Jesus, the great white throne judgment is where they will show up and they will all be found guilty and they will all be cast into the lake of fire. But there's the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ, where believers appear to have their works tested and they will be tested by fire to see what they're made out of. And if they were works of the flesh, if they were works of compromise, if they were works of foolishness, if they were works of greed, if they were works of gluttony, if they were works of lust, if they were works of hatred and malice, they will burn up. But all those things that were done to the glory of God, in obedience to the word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the walk of faith, those things will come forth as jewels. You'll have taken it with you because what you did here was for Christ and not for yourself. The sacrifices you made were for Christ, not so that by staying up later you could get richer or whatever your happens to be. Shine as jewels. Come forth tried as pure gold. The scripture has many different illustrations of that. But that's what the walk of faith is all about. That was one of the first lessons God was trying to teach Israel in the wilderness. Trust him. Trust him. Walk by faith, not by sight. They were experiencing through their five senses. Here, they didn't like the flavor. They had the sense of taste that was involved here, and so they began to gripe because it wasn't just quite right. How many times have you griped, say, about the food God has provided because it wasn't just quite right? And so you spit it out or you threw it away. Instead of saying, thank you, Lord, for the sustaining food that you gave to me. Here with them, it happened to be water. They're going to have another water test coming down the road, and we'll see that hopefully if we get there today. But um, walking by faith and heavenly rewards. Failure to walk by faith 
God says, is rebellion in his eyes because you are trusting something or someone else instead of trusting him. That incredible premium that God places on it takes up the whole chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, and these people are our example in every situation. And we noticed without faith, verse 6, it is impossible, not hard, not difficult, not very few people make it, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe, not hopefully must, or, you know, well, most of the time, it's must believe that he is, and, now here we get back to rewards again, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You entered the Christian life the moment you trusted in Jesus Christ. The moment you had faith that he alone could save you, that he had died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. When you believed that with all your heart and trusted him to save you, you were saved. But faith does not stop there. He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now he's going to list a whole bunch of people who were clearly saved. We're going to see them in heaven. But they gave their hearts and their lives to serving the living God. They diligently sought him. They wanted his face. They wanted to come into his presence. They were willing to give up everything for him and him alone. Do you have that desire? Do you have that earnest expectation? Do you have that gripping in your soul that you can hardly bear to, to go any farther without Jesus? You've got to go to him. Oh, I hope you do. That brings me to tears many times during the week. Oh, Lord, I'm such a lousy servant. Help me to serve you better. Help me to be more passionate. Help me to have greater desire for Christ. Help me to have greater desire for the scriptures. Help me to have a greater desire for the things of the Lord. Help me have a greater desire to see souls saved and growing in Christ. Do you ever, ever have that? Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Do you want heavenly rewards? He's the rewarder. He's the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Are you passionate for Him? Do you pursue God? Do you run after Him as hard as you possibly can? Because you want Him above all else and let everything else fall by the wayside. Is that your desire? What are you going to take with you? Wood, hay, and stubble? Burns up. Gold, silver, precious stones. They endure the test of fire. Which will it be? You can't get any of these over here unless you walk by faith. That is the principal lesson God is teaching Israel as they begin their wilderness wanderings. So to summarize, we've learned many lessons that are subcategories of these various points of rebellion so far. And God, of course, killed the adult Israelites because of those points of rebellion in the wilderness. But the key points of rebellion that we've seen thus far, they're two in number. They included... For this death sentence that Israel got, failure number one, the point of rebellion that we looked at, the taught multiple lessons, but the principal point of rebellion which God counted as charge number one in his death sentence for the adult Jews was rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. That's what we saw in our first set of lessons on this subject. Failure number two, which is what I've just described for you, the second point of rebellion that God counted as charge number two in the death sentence of the adult Israelites was refusing to walk by faith is rebellion against God. Refusing to walk by faith is rebellion against God. Walking by faith must become for the believer a habitual lifestyle. It's also called, and we've talked about this, walking in the spirit. Magnificent to think about walking not in your own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit of God, 
who moved across the face of the waters in Genesis chapter 1. When creation was taking place, if you are a believer, he dwells in you and you can walk in his power. Why walk in the flesh? Paul talks about that in Romans 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Down in verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. How are you walking? Paul says it in Galatians, two verses in Galatians, chapter uh, 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Do you want victory over the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons? Do you want to have a, a situation whereby whenever those temptations come along, you can just w drop it off like water off a duck's back? This is the guarantee. Walk in in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh think about the last time you fell into the lusts of the flesh whatever it happened to be run through the seven deadly sins in your head once again like we studied a whole series on the seven deadly sins run through it in your head what's the last one that hit you what's the one that that bugs you the most what's the one that is always a temptation because the devil knows he can always trip you up on that point What's the one that's the hardest one for you? Here's God's promise. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's a guarantee. And that's all you have to do is walk in the Spirit. We've done a whole series on that. Dear people, What's your focus? What's your goal? Make it Jesus. You'll walk in the Spirit. What's your earnest desire? What's your passion? When you walk by faith, you're walking in the Spirit. When you learn to trust God, learn to trust His Word, learn to obey it even though you can't see it, that's walking by faith and that's walking in the Spirit. One more verse, verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, which you do if you're saved, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, if you're not a believer, you're not living in the Spirit. If you're not living in the Spirit, you can't walk in the Spirit. You have to trust Jesus first. The first issue of faith is for salvation. Believing with all your hearts that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scripture, not just as a matter of intellectual acknowledgement, but as a matter of saying, because he did that, I'm going to trust him with my life, with my eternity, and with the time present so that I can live for him because I'm so thankful, so excited about him. If you don't have that kind of desire... You might do what Paul suggests, to examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith or whether or not you are reprobate. It's not my suggestion. That's Paul's suggestion, and that's part of the Bible. Say, ho-hum, it doesn't matter to me, then you're probably lost. You're probably headed for hell. No matter how many times you've warmed a pew in church, you're going to burn. It's far better to have the works of the flesh burned up, but yet be saved by fire, that's how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians, than to have yourself burned. Let the works burn. And there may be a few, maybe you did them by accident, where you walked by faith. But why let it be that way? Why not, one, number one, trust Christ alone for your salvation? He'll give it to you, and you can never lose it once you've got it. And then number two, learn to walk by faith. You trusted him, you know, for the greatest thing in the world, which is your salvation, your eternity. Why not trust him for daily stuff also? The simple things of life. And walk by faith, walk in the Spirit, and suddenly you're getting the rewards of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. 
But remember the last phrase of that verse 25, Colossians 3, 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. It's your choice. And the issue comes down to walking by faith. And that was the second major point of rebellion against God. So the three sub-lessons and the sub-points of rebellion that we learned at the instance at Mara, number one, here are the three sub-points. Number one, having a bitter spirit is rebellion against God because it blames him for doing evil when he meant it for good. Remember what Joseph said, speaking of his brothers who had sold him into slavery and he went through all those horrible things down in Egypt, including, you know, false accusations against him for a crime he didn't commit, time in jail. I mean, you know, he, he had a bad rap. But Joseph, looking at his brother, said, You meant it unto me for evil, but God meant it for good, to save alive as it is this day much souls. He understood the sovereignty of God in the times of pain, in the times of pressure, in the times where we were overwhelmed and we can't get our head around it. We think of it, that was an evil thing that happened, but God meant it for good, to save alive as it is this day much souls. When we get the long-range view, when we see God's view in it, we suddenly realize God meant it for salvation, for eternity, for the guarantee of hope, the guarantee of rewards. Our people, old athletics saying, no gain without pain. Well, it's a biblical principle, too. God allows the pain to come into our lives so that we'll quit trusting the stuff around us and start trusting him. And he does it because he loves you. Why did I spank my kids when they were little? Because I was really sick and tired of little brats running around? No. I spanked them because I loved them. I walked by faith on that. Because the Bible says that when a child disobeys, he must be disciplined, he must be spanked, so that he will, not he will learn not to do it again. You see, that's what God does. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You're not his children. If you never get spanked, you're not one of God's kids. He does it because he loves us. He wants us to have happy, cheerful, productive lives, which you will never have when you're in rebellion against him. Israel had to find that out the hard way as they wandered through the wilderness. That brought us to the third instance of rebellion, which was at the wilderness of sin. Again, now this is what we saw last time, that the Israelites' concerns were totally, completely carnal, selfish, self-serving, and focused exclusively on comfort, uh, personal comfort. Of course, we see once again, in fact, in almost every one of the points of rebellion, they're also rebelling against Moses and Aaron, or Moses, or Moses alone. But we learn something new. They're focused on personal comfort. They took their journey from Elim, and they went between Elim and Sinai into the wilderness of sin. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness, and they said, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots. Oh, now here it's not drink, it's food. Yum, yum. And when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. More false accusations, of course, against Moses. You know, when God chose to kill the children of Israel, I mean, he did provide for them, he sent them quail, but some of them he killed on the spot. He didn't even let them wander for 40 years. He said, well, the, the meat was between their teeth. He killed them. He wasn't very pleased with these folks. Get it? And we talked about that in relation to the sin of gluttony. Manna and quails was over in Exodus 16, verses 11 through 15, and then we came in, of course, that was where God sent the manna on the ground. It looked like uh, dew on the ground, small like hoarfrost. God said, only gather so much. I want you to gather it day by day. On Friday, you're supposed to gather a double amount because you're not going to get any on Saturday. And some of the people said, well, you know, it's, it's been here every morning so far. So, you know, it's probably a natural 
cause behind this. So we're going to go out and look for it on Saturday. And they went out and looked for it on Saturday, and it wasn't there. They were supposed to have gathered twice. And some of the people said, man, you know, well, it's gotten here the first day, and it got here the second day. might not come for the third day. So they gathered extra stuff. They got more than God said to get. And what had happened to it? It turned all moldy and wormy. God is teaching a lesson, which is to obey him precisely. He does not want you modifying his plans. Can you imagine you're at NASA and you are involved in sending a manned rocket to the moon? And you see how the other scientists have set this thing up and you're sort of a junior scientist and you think you've got some better ideas than they do. And so you while they're out on lunch break or whatever, you go in and monkey around with the computer and you change just a few little digits here and there. What is going to happen to that moon launch? It's going to either blow up on the pad or it's not going to hit the target. God wants precision. If you have to have precision for a moon launch, how much more do you think that God wants you to obey him precisely and specifically, not to do it your own way, not to modify it, not to come up with a, a better plan or, you know, why don't we try this, Lord, instead, and let, let's just use it sort of as an experiment, and then we'll come back to your plan if it doesn't work. You cannot do that. If you do, you're in serious trouble. That's what happened to Israel here. Men and quails, they were not supposed to gather too much. And some did. They were, not, they were supposed to gather twice as much on Friday. Some didn't. And they paid the consequences as a result. Six days shall ye gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it shall there be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And what did God say about that? Ha, 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 ha. You guys are stupid. No, that's not what God said. Listen to what God said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws. That's God's perspective on it. He wasn't just a little boo-boo. He was trying to teach them obedience. Parents, what you want to develop in your children is obedience. Because the parents no better than the kids. The parents have been around a lot longer than the kids. The parents have seen what happens in life when you do not follow the rules. Some of you have probably known this by speeding down the road and you suddenly saw a little red cherry blinking in the rearview mirror. <laughs> you say, but I was only going 27 miles over the speed limit. I mean, like, what's 27 miles an hour? I mean, it was a 25 mile an hour speed limit, but it was a big wide road and, and there was nobody on the road and so I gunned it and I hit 52. And you got a ticket. Did you know God's laws are more significant than your ideas? Than your reason? Than your emotions? And you know something, folks? These passages that we've been looking at here are before God ever gave the law at Sinai. He was already teaching them about his character. We don't get to Sinai until after they leave Rephidim. We haven't even gotten to Rephidim yet. Now, Rephidim is after the wilderness of sin. But then they're at Rephidim and we learn some other lessons there. They were supposed to have learned some. Hopefully we will learn them. And it's then that they go and camp at the foot of the mountain. Three tests failed for which they are held accountable before the giving of the law. I think that teaches us a principle that God judges those who are with the law and God judges those without the law because he has already revealed enough about his person and character where we know that this is the one we must obey. No, we don't like that. We're humans. It bugs us. It irritates our flesh. But hey, 
if you're not careful, whether you like it or not, you will be accountable. And someday you'll stand before him and he'll say, why did you do this? Why did you refuse my offer of salvation? Why did you refuse to walk by faith? I gave you an opportunity. I gave you a little quiz. Not the big test yet, but I gave you a little quiz. And you absolutely refused to put down the answers that I taught you. That wasn't just because you were stupid. It wasn't just because you made a mistake. It's you liked a different answer better. Now, suppose a student said that in class. Some of you are teachers. Suppose a student said that in class. Well, now look. Yeah, I know that's what you taught us in class, and I know that, that that was what, I really understood that. But you know, I think there's a better answer, and I like my answer better than your answer. What's the teacher going to do to that particular question? A check mark or an X? Come on. Who fit? An X, that's right. It's wrong. Because the teacher's the boss. The teacher's in charge. Now God, who knows everything, who never makes a mistake, who is perfectly righteous and perfectly loving and perfectly holy and all the immutable characteristics of God, all of his attributes. When he tells you something, do you not think that he is right? So why do we insist on just fudging it a little bit, our direction, because that's how we feel about it? Dear people, Israel was given as an illustration for the church so that we will understand who God is and what God is like, and so that we won't fall into the same stupid traps that Israel fell into. We have to learn. Why do you think I'm preaching this series? Because these ten failures brought them to the point of death. And Paul tells us these are the things that are supposed to teach us so that we won't go through that also. That's serious. And so tied that together about the gathering, you know, refusing to gather and some gathering too much. Um, hoarding. We talked about hoarding two weeks ago. Not merely wise planning, but hoarding is a common sin among Christians. And we talked about how some of you are hoarders. You collect rubbish. You have so many piles of it, you don't have room for it. And you stuff it full all over every place that you have any kind of space until you can't even walk there anymore. Well, you know what that is. That's the visible manifestation of covetousness. And Paul says in Colossians 3.5 and Ephesians 5.5, 5, covetousness is idolatry. For its sake, things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon you, upon the children of men, upon those who are hoarders, those who are covetous. God hates covetousness. Why? Because it means you're trusting stuff and you're not trusting him. It's a very serious sin, folks. And God killed people for doing that. The outward manifestation of covetousness is hoarding means you have a false God. You're expecting that God to meet your needs rather than having the God of heaven meet your needs. And you can hoard anything you want. I mean, you can, you can, you know, collect plastic, you know, little elephants or those little ceramic things. I mean, I've seen people had millions of these little <laughs> ceramic things all over the place. I mean, what good is this? You know, you can hoard money. Uh, you can hoard just whatever looks cool to you and does, you don't know what you're going to use it for, but you store it anyway. I mean, it can take many different forms. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, that means put to death, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, is that pretty bad? Yep. Yeah. Uncleanness, pretty bad? Yep. Yeah. Inordinate affection, that's desiring evil things. Evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. That's a pretty bad list to be in, folks. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. In the which also ye, now listen, what's this next word? In the which ye also, begins with a W, who can guess it? Walked, walked. In which you also walked sometime when you lived in them. Walk. Haven't we just been talking about walking? The believer is supposed to walk by faith. Walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust thereof. But we used to walk someplace else. We walked in all those things, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil, concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on children, in which also ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. You live in the Spirit now. If you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. Don't live in the Spirit and keep walking in the flesh. 
Do you see how scripture ties together? I mean, no matter where you go, you're going to find this. For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. We've just been talking about inheritances, and we've been talking about rewards. And we've seen the context of multiple passages where God says, that's what you get for walking by faith. That's what you get for walking in the Spirit. You don't get your salvation that way. But when you are talking about rewards, that's how you get it. Walking by faith means walking in obedience to the Word of God, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Walking in a way that is pleasing to God Are you doing it? Or will you be among those who, when you stand before the Lord in heaven, you know there are going to be tears in heaven until the end of the millennium? It says so in the book of Revelation. We're going to get there when we get that, get that far. It's probably 45 years from now, but anyway, try to go through Revelation. But there are tears in heaven after the rapture, after the Bema, tears in heaven. And they're not wiped away until the end of the millennium. Because there are going to be people who said, why did I throw that away? And you will never, never, never get it back. A reward that could have been yours, which would enable you to shine and reflect the glory of Christ even more through all of eternity. Dear ones, I don't want you to lose it. Parents love their children. They don't want them to lose certain blessings and promises and benefits. Shepherds love their sheep. And though sometimes I'm sure you think it doesn't feel like it, I love you too. Well, anyway, so that brings us to our last seven minutes. <laughs> the message for today. The message... The next point of failure after the wilderness of sin counted against Israel in a death sentence was at Rephidim. It was at Rephidim that Moses struck the rock, producing water. Uh, you'll find that recorded in Exodus 17, 1 through 7, and in Exodus chapter 19, verse 2. It was also at Rephidim that Israel fought with the Amalekites, while Aaron and Hur supported Moses' hands in prayer as Joshua won a great victory over Amalek, and that's in uh, Exodus 17, verses 8 through 16. We'll be getting there shortly. But when his hands were raised up, Israel won. When his hands fell down, Israel lost. Do you think that God had a point that he wanted to teach us out of that? Come on, say yes or no. Yes! yes! God had a point. He didn't just say, wasn't that a cool incident? Hey, I mean, well, what a circumstance. I mean, when he had his hands up, we're winning. When he has his hands down, we're losing. Hmm, what a circumstance. And so Aaron thinks, well, let's see if we can't manipulate God a little bit, and we'll grab that one hand and hold it up. And Hur says, yeah, it's a good idea. And he gets on the other side, and he grabs this hand, and goes, no, holds it up. And they say, oh, look, we're winning again. What a circumstance. What a coincidence. But I guess we might as well do this. It's teaching at least two principles. And I want to talk about that later when we get to the passage. But number one, intercessory prayer is necessary for victory. We learn that clearly in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Number two, you can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. People, I pray for you, but I hope you pray for one another. And I hope you pray fervently for me. I cannot fight this battle alone. Well, that's the introduction to it. Let's move on. So, at Rephidim, as we, by the way, as we read this passage, uh, notice how many times Israel questions, just like they had done at the first two instances, how many times Israel questions the motives of Moses. So there's this rebellion against the leadership again. That, that follows through in all of the different passages. They accuse Moses of murderous intent. Oh, we've seen that one before, too. You brought us out here to die of thirst in the wilderness. They question the motives of God. 
they accuse God of murderous intent. This is Exodus chapter 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin, which is where we've just seen them, after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord. So at least they got that right. Hey, we get to move. Let's all get up and go, go, go. So they moved when God said to move. And they pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. You know, this is the same test that they faced before, but just in a different form. The first test was bad water. Here we've got no water. God is sort of saying to them, have you learned your lesson yet? Do you know how to apply the principle that I've just taught you? Did you really learn it when I gave you the answers to test number one? You know, sometimes teachers do that. They'll give another test, but they'll rephrase the question just slightly differently. You know, I have a history test, uh, and on the first uh, test, uh, the, the question was, who was the first president of the United States? And the answer is not King George. <laughs> the answer is George Washington. So they give the test again, but with a slightly different phrase. This time, instead of asking, who was the first president of the United States? They say, true or false, George Washington was the first president of the United States. The kid scratches his head and he says, man, I've never seen that question before. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, you know, Israel is like that. We get here to the second test. It's the same test, but in a different form. First one was bad water. Now we have no water. Have you learned your lesson? Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. Have you heard this before? <laughs> have you heard this before? Yes. They said the same thing when they got the bad water at Marah. <laughs> Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Quit griping to me. You know, I'm not the one who makes water. Who makes water? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <laughs> and what did he make? A planet where it's 70% water. people murmured the people thirsted therefore water and the people murmured against Moses and said wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt have you heard that phrase before why did you bring us up out of Egypt oh now we're going to figure it out we're, we're going to figure out why you brought us out to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst oh you've heard that before I think we have you know, but you know, it's something very interesting about this. And it's the way people think. They're bringing the same accusations. You say, now, didn't they learn the first time? But, but wait a minute. What they learned apparently was, well, when we griped this way before, it worked, so we'll try it again. Wrong lesson. Instead of learning, hey, we can trust God. God takes care of water. God did a really cool thing back here where, at Mara where he turned that bitter water into sweet water. Let's trust God. Instead, of, they said, you know, we griped about water back there, and we got good water. So here we have no water, so let's gripe about water again, and maybe that will make water for us. Wrong lesson. A wrong answer to the lesson. Trust God. Before we had something, now we've got nothing. Have you ever been in that situation? You're walking through life, and, and you had only a little bit, and, and, uh, and you, you somehow managed to squeak by, and whew, afterwards you thank God that you've been squeaked by, and then you came a little farther in your life, and you suddenly had nothing. The way you responded in the first instance will be the way you respond in the second instance unless you learn the lesson of walking by faith. Because when you learn the lesson of walking by faith, that means that God let you at least have something at the beginning, so it wasn't quite as tough to trust him. And now he says, now I'm going to see if you've really learned to trust me. Now you've got nothing. Where's your focus? On the empty pot? Or on the eternal, omnipotent provider? You know, we have a lot of illustrations of this. Or we could go to Elijah and all the things that happened with Elijah and the, the stew pots and the cruise of oil and the cruises of water. And I mean, there are all kinds of places all over the Bible. Maybe we'll have time when we get farther. But there are all places all over the Bible where somebody has nothing and they learn to trust God. 
And Jesus says that is the most incredible thing. Remember they were standing in the temple? His disciples are with him and he's watching the pot. People are dropping in money. Bonk, bonk, and here comes this rich guy. A bunch of guys playing their trumpet. And he brings this big bag and he lifts it up out of the cart. And it falls in. Stands up, looks like this. He looks around and everybody's going, Good job, good job! We needed that money in the temple! While everybody's paying attention to him, little widow, hoping nobody sees her, she comes up, she drops in two mites, and then hurries away. All the disciples are still looking at that rich guy. Jesus says, hey, pay attention. You didn't see what's going on? Look, see the widow? She gave more than all the rest of these people because she gave all that she had. She'd learned to walk by faith. If you got all the money you need, you don't have to walk by faith, or at least you think you don't have to walk by faith. She gave all that she had. The walk of faith. Rephidim, hear the people. We, well, we complained before and it worked, so maybe it'll work again. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They'd be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Where's Moses? Relax. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still God. I'm the one that put you there. I'll take care of you. The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. Take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod. Now, they're going to know this rod. This is the one wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. And behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb. And thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Oh, we get the rest of their complaint. At first they were chiding with Moses, but it says here now, they tempted the Lord, and here's what they said. Is the Lord among us or not? Come on, God, prove yourself. Come on, prove you're really there. We want to see it, God. Come on. God is not your lap dog, and he doesn't jump at your command. Never tempt the Lord. Never put him to the test. He is God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. So many things that we have to learn as we go through the scriptures. Each one of us them teaching us more things about how we're supposed to live, not just what we're supposed to think in our heads as very cool instances in history, but things that are to transform our lives as we understand how you deal with your people, what pleases you and what does not please you. And what pleases you is when we walk by faith, believing your word, even if it costs our lives. Father, help us to learn that lesson and to walk by faith with joy in the power of your spirit to the glory of your son in obedience to the word of God. Let us walk by faith and know that you're always there upon the rock, for you are the rock that meets our needs in every case. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.